Christmas is now over. I hear some going in relief and this. I don't know about y'all. I love Christmas. I, I just love Christmas. And, and, you know, here we are just a few days out of Christmas. We're not quite to the new year. And, uh, you know, I still have Christmas spirit. We still have our decorations up. Our tree's not going to come down till, till after the new year. And uh, I'm still wearing my Christmas tie. Uh, I, I just still love Christmas. And so for that reason, I wanted to continue our series on Christmas carols. And uh, I've enjoyed this series as I've went through it, starting with the joy to the world and Emmanuel, go tell it on the mountain. Uh, I've, I've just really enjoyed this, this past series that we've done. And as we've, we've looked at each of the words of the song and, and where they come from, we find out that some of them, uh, the ones that we've covered anyway, have scriptural meaning. They all come out of Scripture. Now, there's a lot of songs out there, uh, a lot of good Christmas songs, ones that we sing all the time. There's nothing scriptural about them. They, they, <laughs> they, they sound good. They're pretty. They're, they're, they're wonderful songs, but they're not really scriptural. You know, we, we sing Away in a Manger. And it says right there, No, lo no crying he makes. Well, there's nothing that says that. We, we read that Jesus was human. He came into the world like any other human baby. And yeah, I'm sure he, he cried. He better have because that's the first thing they do. That's how they get their first air, first breath. So if he didn't cry, then he wouldn't have been human. You know, stuff like that. Um, angels we have heard on high. You know, it talks, we, we, we hear about the angels. The songs talk about the angels singing. Scripture don't say one word about the angels singing at his birth. It says they proclaimed and they spoke. But there's a lot of a lot of scripture that or a lot of songs that we sing and a lot of songs that we listen to that, that really aren't that scriptural. But I love, still love the Christmas songs. And the one that I picked for today is one that uh, it is it, it is very Christmassy. Uh, it talks a lot about uh, about Jesus' birth. But it says so much more. And it is bathed in Scripture. As you go through the song, Good Christian Men Rejoice. Every I, I, do a, I, I did a, a research on it. And, and every line, there's like four, three or four scriptural references that you could find for every line that goes in that song. There is so much Scripture that has to do with Good Christian Men Rejoice. And, and, and for that reason, I love the song. And it says so much. But as we look at the words of the song, it starts out with good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give ye heed to what we say, Jesus Christ is born today. Man and beast before him bow. Now in some of the scriptures, or in some, some versions of the song, what we see in our book says man and beast before him bow. Some say heaven and earth before him bow. Some say ox and ass before him bow. And he is in the manger now. Christ is born today. Well, in the second verse, it starts out with the same start. But then it says, now ye hear of endless bliss. Jesus Christ was born for this. He hath opened the heavenly door and man is blessed for every more. But then it ends that one with Christ was born for this. Then the last one is good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. Jesus Christ was born to save. Calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting hall. Christ was born to save. Christ was born to save. When we see this song, we see, uh, we see rejoicing. We see joy. We see an, over, an un, unmatched joy coming out of this. Um, it says that we don't just need to sing about rejoicing. We don't just need to show it outwardly. But we need to rejoice in our heart. We need to rejoice in our soul. Everything about us uh, needs to be rejoicing. Now, there's a lot of verses, there's a lot of, of scripture 
that talks about rejoicing. There's a lot of scripture that talks about joy. I want to look at one, and we're going to do a lot, we're going to cover a lot of scripture today, but I want to look at one in particular that talks about rejoicing, and that is in Zechariah. You don't hear many preachers preach out of Zechariah, but Zechariah chapter 2. Zechariah might take a few of you, some of you, a few minutes to find. But like I said, we we don't we don't read much out of Zechariah. Not, not, not many people go to Zechariah a lot. But in Zechariah chapter two, starting in verse ten, it says, "Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Jer of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst." says the Lord. Many nations shall join to the Lord in that day and, there shall become, and they shall become my people and I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this scripture that you give us. And Lord, we just, we, as we read these scriptures today and as we look at your word, Lord, help us to rejoice. Help us to rejoice in who you are. Help us to rejoice in what you are. And help us to rejoice in what you've done for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. That tells us that we need to be rejoicing all the time. And, uh, and rejoicing is something we should always have joy in our heart. We've, I've preached on joy I don't know how many times over the years. And, and, and one thing I love about joy is joy can always be with us. Joy is not circumstantial. Happiness is joy, circumstantial, but joy is not. With joy comes rejoicing. When you have joy in your heart, you rejoice. And, and for that reason, we need to be doing that always. But here, rather than just saying rejoice in the Lord always, we see that we have a reason to rejoice. Here this scripture gives us a specific reason to rejoice. And this is what the song is talking about. I am coming, and I will be in your midst. Boy, that's a reason to rejoice. What other reason do we, can we think of to rejoice. You see, Jesus Christ came to this earth. We talked about it in, in when we talked about the song Emmanuel, how Jesus was God with us. Jesus came and lit, you know, came as a baby and lived on this earth just like you and I. But we've got to remember that he sent the Holy Spirit as well. So not only did Jesus come to the earth, and not only did he live for that 33 years on the earth, but he's still here. He's still in our midst. And because of that, we have reason to rejoice. Now, um, we, as we look at this, and as I, I look at this scripture, we see God coming to earth. And, and I don't know how many times I've talked about the Trinity, and I don't know how many times I will talk about the Trinity, but it's one of those things that we'll never totally understand. But when we say that God sent Jesus to this world, and then we say, we, we know the Scripture. The Scripture says, Jesus said, I will send a comforter to you. When we really look at it and we really dig down into it and we see that, that God is is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's everything. He is the sovereignty of God and the trinity of God makes us understand that God the Father is the same God as God the Son and the same God as God the Holy Spirit. So when we see that it says Jesus was sent, God sent his Son to the earth, we could also say it this way. God came to the earth in the form of a child rather than saying God sent his son. He put that in there so that we could understand it better, but we could also look at it when Jesus told his disciples that I will send a comforter to you. Here's what he could have said. I will come back to you in the form of a comforter. You see, he's the same. God is the same in, in different forms. He is the same way for, he's the same God 
just in how we need him. The thing is, if, if there was another way that God needed to come to us, he would. But those three forms is how he chose as God the Father, the Creator, God the Son who came to this earth, and then God the Holy Spirit who still lives among us and is around us. You see, this scripture, as it tells us that he is going to dwell in our midst. And because of that, because of the fact that he come and lived in the midst of us, he is around us, he is with us today, we have reason to rejoice. That is enough reason to rejoice. We don't need anything else to rejoice about. We've got the fact that God is with us. We've got the fact that God lives amongst us. Amongst us. He is in our midst. And for that reason, we have reason to rejoice. Now, he says this out to the daughter of Zion. This is talking to the Israelites. But then I love there in verse 11 what he says. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord. And I will dwell in your midst. And they shall become my people. You see, because of that verse right there, I have reason to rejoice. You see, I'm not Jewish. I'm not, I'm not of the, the daughters of, Z of Zion. I am, I, I'm not Jewish. I'm, I would be a Gentile. But here it says, Many nations shall join to the Lord and shall be His people. So that gives me reason to rejoice. That gives you reason to rejoice. We have reason to rejoice beyond anybody else. Anyone who knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior has reason to rejoice. That's why the song says, Good Christian men rejoice. Now, he's not leaving, it's not leaving out women. Mankind. Let's... When we, see, when we see men, a lot of times it means mankind. Uh, I, I'm not, um, we're not going to get like some of the denominations and take all male references out of the Bible or anything uh, or out of our songs. But here when it says good Christian men, it is talking about Christian people. It is talking about all of us who are Christians. We have reason to rejoice. Now here's the thing. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're not a Christian, you have nothing to rejoice about. You might be a happy person. You might be able to, to feel good about certain things in your life, but you don't have the joy of God in your life, and you ha don't have that true reason to rejoice. And uh, because of Jesus coming to to this earth that is reason enough to rejoice he came to this earth he died on the cross he rose from the dead he ascended to heaven but then he came back in the form of the Holy Ghost who still lives among us and that is all the reason in the world that we really need to rejoice as we look at the rest of chapter of verse 1 there though let's go to Philippians chapter 2 in Philippians chapter 2, it addresses part of that verse. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 1, it says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort, comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through self-ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, and those in of those in heaven and those on earth and of, of those under the earth, 
and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, as we look at that, that first part there, those first four, four verses, they tell us that we as Christians, if you are a Christian, you need to model your life after Jesus. And we need to, to not be so concerned about ourselves. And that's one of the things that a lot of people, uh, it's easy to get tied up in ourselves and it's easy to, to desire things for ourselves and it's easy to go after things that promote us and it's easy to, to lift ourselves up and feel good about ourselves. That's easy to do and our society encourages it. Our society pushes you to feel good about yourself and to, to promote yourself. But the thing that this tells us here, as Christians, as those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, we need to live the way that he did. We need to forget about ourselves. We need to quit promoting ourselves and promote others. And we need to look after others and we need to try to help others. And we need to sacrifice for others because that's what Jesus did. Jesus came and he came to this earth in the form of a man. He was still God. He came out of heaven. He never stepped down from the throne. He was still equal with God. He was still the creator of the world. John chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that. That he was still God. That he just came to this earth. Gave up. Walked away from the throne. Walked away from the throne room. And stepped down into this earth. Took on the form of a man. A lowly man. The form of a bond servant. Now that's not to say that he was a slave, but it means that he was not nobility. He, was, he didn't come down and live in the palace. He came down and lived like, like common folks. And he came down and he, he, he lived his life in a way that had no reputation. He wasn't, he wasn't exalted. He wasn't from a great family. But yet, even though he came down that way, and he gave up all that he had. Folks, that tells us as Christians, that's how we need to look at things. That's how we need to look at each other. That's how we need to live our lives the way that he did, sacrificing for others. And when we do that, when, we, when, you, when you give to others, when you help others, when you are more concerned with others than you are yourself, trust me, you will have a reason to rejoice. God will give you more and more reason to rejoice. Because of Jesus coming to this earth and giving up all he had and dying a, a cruel death, even the death of the cross, he is more highly exalted. Now, he was already God. But because of his sacrifice, he is even more highly exalted. And I love the, the, the song says, man and beast before him bow. How much truth is in that song? Man and beast will bow before him. Everyone, every knee will bow. I don't care if you're, if you're the number one atheist in the world. If you, if, you, if you have denied Christ, if you've worshipped Satan, if you've been a witchcraft. I don't care what you've been. I don't care how much you've denied Christ in your life. How much you've denied God in your life. I don't care how much you've told people that you're your own God or whatever. There will be a point... At the end of time, that you will stand before the throne and you will look at him and say, You are Lord. You are God. And you will bow before him. You can't help it. When you are in front of that majesty, when you are in front of that God, you won't be able to help it. You won't be able to stand before him. The only question is, do you bow before him now? Or do you bow before him when it's too late to do anything about it? The fact is that you will bow before him. We can't help it. That, that, that's been told many times in Scripture. Matter of fact, this Scripture, it, it, it refers back to, to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 45. And then again, in Matthew refers back to it. It says, Look to me and be saved. All you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall take an oath. God 
is God. Jesus is God. He is so highly exalted. He is perfect. And whether you like it or not. I, I've heard it said, well, you know, uh, I heard somebody say one time, they said, God said it, I believe it, and it's true. It, the, 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 the thing is, if God said it, it don't matter if you believe it or not, it's true. Man. We can't, your belief has nothing to do with it. God is God, and you will bow before Him. And He is, he is almighty, He is all-powerful, He is all-knowing. All and every knee will fall before him. Every knee will bow to him. And every knee or every mouth will proclaim him as Lord of all. Every, every mouth will, will, will tell him, you are God. You see, Jesus even proclaimed it. One of, one of the greatest scriptures, one of my favorite scriptures is the Great Commission. And that tells us to go out and, and make disciples of all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But right before he says that, he says, it says in, in Matthew chapter 20, it says that Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You see, he is the authority. It, the buck stops here. You know, I, I, I've heard dads say that before. It stopped, the buck stops here. No, it don't. It stops with Jesus. There's no, you, you, you know, when I, when I uh, deal with certain people, you know, sometimes, remember one time I was, had to deal with Verizon. And, uh, or no, it was uh, T-Mobile's when we changed over to Verizon. And they were trying to charge me when they changed the coverage. And, you know, I'd, I'd call them and, and, and I'd just tell them, this is what I want to do. Can you do it? And this girl said on the phone, she said, no, no, I can't do that. Okay, well, just look. Before I go any further, just go ahead and let me talk to your manager. And she'd say, uh, okay, and she'd pass me to the manager. And I'd tell them what I wanted. Can you do that? Well, well I need, uh, uh, no. I, well, just go ahead and let me talk to your boss. And I went up the chain until I got where I wanted to be, but where the buck stopped in that company. The thing is, we, we can do that on earth, but listen, when it comes to authority, Jesus is all authority. There's no higher. You can't, there's not another step. You can't go beyond him. He, all authority is given to him, and, and to him everyone will proclaim, and everyone will bow. Um, and we will recognize that. Isaiah chapter 65 says, as we look at the second verse of the song, Isaiah 65 verse 17 says, For behold, I create... A new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people in joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. You see, that second verse tells us that he has opened heaven's door and man is blessed forevermore. We look at this and we see that he is creating. See, Jesus said, I have gone to prepare a place for you. I heard it said one time, he created this world in six days. He's been gone for 2,000 years preparing us another place. Imagine what it's going to be like. <laughs> But he says, I have gone to prepare a place for you. Here we see in Isaiah that, that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth that's going to be descending and it's going to come down and that's going to be our place. That is heaven as we are, have described in the book of Revelation. This is the heaven that he's talking about. This new heaven and new earth. This place will no longer be remembered. You won't, you won't even remember what this was like. You won't even remember this place because you will live in a place of perfection. Man is blessed forevermore. We can't understand forevermore. Do you understand? Do you believe that? We talk about it. We, 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 we tell people about eternity. I love to talk about eternity. But the truth is, is we can't understand it. We really can't. Uh, when it says that man will live or is blessed forevermore, it means it never stops. I remember in, in, in math, they used to use that little symbol of a sideways figure eight for infinity. Time.
time never stops. We can't really understand that our minds cannot fathom infinity. Our minds cannot fathom eternity because we see things and, man, 100 years is a long time. You know, it, we, are, we are 20 years. In three days, we will be 20 years into this new millennium. It seems like yesterday everybody was talking about Y2K. You think about that. 20 years. It's been 19 years since the attack of 9-11. And we, we think about these times, but it seems like you know, we, our minds put times on everything. You know, we, we, we talk about 1971. That was a good year. You know that? It's been 49 years ago. That was a good year. But we think in time. We think in our minds think that way. People, you know, how old are you? How, you know, how long has it been since I've seen you? Everything is about time. And we relate to time really easily. But there's going to be a time when there is no time. There's going to be a time when a year is as a thousand. A second will be as a thousand years. We'll be there for eternity forevermore. Man is blessed forevermore. And we can't even understand it. But because but the thing is, is up there, we will understand it because we won't even remember this place. We won't even remember time. Think about that. that that'll get you thinking for a long time, is that you won't even remember what time was like because you will be there for eternity. You know, today, I, I know people that they can't sit still for just a minute. You know, they get nervous. They get, they, they get fidgety. Y'all know somebody like that? You know, I, 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 you <laughs> I see pointing. But uh, you, you get to where you, uh, you, know, you sit down and, and you start watching a ball game or something. And you, 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 you get antsy or you, you, you go somewhere. You're waiting on your wife to shop and you, you start getting antsy, you know. The thing is, you can't, you can't sit still for 30 minutes. You'll be able to sit at the feet of Jesus forever. And it'll seem like you just got there. Imagine that. Imagine a time when there is no time forevermore. There'll be no more weeping. There'll be no more crying. Because we will be with God. We will be with Jesus. What a reason to rejoice. Lastly, verse 2 and then verse 3 of the song ends in Christ was born for this. And then verse 3 ends with Christ was born to save. That was his reason. That was his purpose. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 says that she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. That was why he came. That was his purpose. He was born for that. You know, we don't think about being born with a purpose. You know, I remember, you know, with our girls as they grew up, we, we wanted them to find what they wanted to do in life. We wanted them to, to, you know, as they got into high school and, you know, started growing, you know, think, be thinking about what you want to do. Think about what your purpose is going to be. Think about why you're going to affect the world. Think about what you can do to make things better. You know, but imagine being born with a purpose and knowing exactly from the day before you were born, but being, knowing why you were here. Only a few people can say that. John the Baptist was one of them. He knew why he was here. He was here to proclaim Jesus. But Jesus was born for one reason. To die on the cross to save us from our sins. And then one of the most famous verses in all of the scripture, John chapter 3. We'll do verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
He came for a reason. I've got two questions this morning. Actually, I've got a few more than that, but two main questions. Number one is, do you have a reason to rejoice? As we've talked about this, we've talked about Jesus coming to save and, and the fact that Jesus came to this earth to die on the cross and that Jesus came to this world to save us all from our sins. And because of that and because He is God with us, because He is still in our midst, we have reason to rejoice. But only for those who believe in Him. But only for those who have given their life to Him really have reason to rejoice. This morning... Do you have reason to rejoice? Can you count yourself among the Christians who says, Jesus has saved me from my sin, and for that reason, I rejoice? If not, then this morning, I'm going to invite you here in just a few minutes to come forward. I'm going to invite you to come and get to know this Jesus. I'm going to invite you to come and get to know this, this one who came to this earth and lived a hard life to save us from our sins. But this morning, if you do know Him and you have a reason to rejoice, are you rejoicing? There are so many people out there who call themselves Christians. So many people who tell you that they have, have given their life to Jesus, but they do not rejoice. They may come and they, they may sing in the choir, they may sing out, in the, but they're not rejoicing with their heart. They're not rejoicing with their soul. They're not rejoicing with their voice. Are you rejoicing? Matter of fact, can, do, do people see you and think, that's a rejoicing person. That person's got to be a, a believer because of all the joy they've got in their life. If you're not rejoicing this morning, what is holding you back? What keeps you from rejoicing? Because joy is not circumstantial are you are you trusting everything to Christ this morning as we stand and as we sing